So we will do that right now. Okay, so we're not technologically um, capable at all times, but this screen will share with you what I call disclaimers or rules of the webinar. So before we get started, there are a few, few rules to this webinar. First of all, the information that is shared today is for general information. You are always encouraged to confirm this information information from this webinar with your own provider. And please never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment because of the information in this webinar. I have one more disclaimer to add. We are nurses trained in caring for patients. We are neither webinar experts or technology gurus. Please be patient with us as we embark upon this new endeavor. Thank you. How the After Lunch Series came to be. So we have an informal lunchtime gathering every Friday. We call it the Lunch Bunch with the ALS nurses. And we, we use this as an opportunity for our more seasoned nurse, Sarah, to share her knowledge with us newer nurses. We would talk about common interventions and treatments for ALS, including G-tubes, BiPAP, and excess saliva. We have good synergy and a desire to share our knowledge with people living with ALS and their caregivers, and we decided to, do, to use a webinar platform. Collectively, we came up with the name After Lunch Series to incorporate the letters ALS. Our intent is to turn our conversation into a presentation to share with people who come to MGH as patients, as well as those beyond the walls of MGH. We hope that you can use this as a teaching tool and a resource guide to use later on should you decide to think about getting a G2. The website that this webinar will remain on is the MGH ALS website. And you can find us at www.massgeneral dot org forward slash ALS. Next one. Thank you. <laughs> As I said, we are technologically challenged here. So we are going to talk about gastrostomy tubes in ALS, also known as G-tubes, feeding tubes, and PEG tubes. For today's webinar, we are going to refer to them as G-tubes. We realize that this is a very big and serious decision and very personal. There is no right or wrong decision. So we hope that you use this webinar as a resource to think about the best decision for you. We realize that information varies not only amongst patients, but providers and institutions. We always suggest that you consult with your own ALS provider. So the goal for our G-tube, and I'm going to now, before I hand over the talk to one of the nurses, let you know that also in the room with myself is Sarah Lupino, Taylor Sterrett, and Danica Sanders. So they, are, they work with me here at the um, ALS Center, and they are all research or clinical research nurses. So Sarah is going to talk about the basics about a G-tube. And then Taylor's going to take over and talk about what's involved in a G-tube placement. And then Danica is going to bring up the rear with G-tube care at home. And then we will leave some time to have some opportunity for you to ask questions, and we will provide you with answers. Please know that others may see the information that you share in the chat bar, including your name. At this time, it is my um, pleasure to hand off the talk to Sarah Lupino. Thank you, Judy. 
So our first topic of discussion is to just go over the basics of what is a G-tube. So like Judy was talking about earlier, the word G-tube, um, the G is short for gastrostomy tube, um, which simply means the word gastrostomy um, is a type of feeding tube that's inserted directly into the stomach. So there's many different types of feeding tubes, and I think a feeding tube is like an umbrella term. Um, and the type of feeding tube that we recommend in our ALS population primarily is a tube that goes directly into the stomach. Um, the use of a G-tube can help provide people with a daily source of calories and nutrients through liquid formula, which is a prescription formula that your doctor would write for you, or it could be a formula that a patient makes at home by blenderizing or pureeing their own food. Um, you can put water through the feeding tube for hydration and also medication, and it goes, like I said, directly through the tube into the stomach. The water that you'd put through the G-tube can be regular tap water, um, and the medications could be medications that you have written in a liquid formulation or medications that you can crush up, dissolve in water, and put directly into the feeding tube. So when is it time to think about a G-tube? So um, what we often try to do um, in our clinic with our patients is think of a feeding tube as a tool to potentially solve a problem. So what are some of the common problems that we see in ALS with our patients that help guide us towards maybe we need to start thinking about the feeding tube as a possible intervention to help? So the first one that we um, usually tease out or look at is difficulty chewing or swallowing food. Um, this could be due to weakness of the muscles that affect chewing and swallowing. Um, some patients say that as this becomes more affected in their disease, they find eating to become very fatiguing and very um, zaps a lot of their energy. Um, some patients say that they have a lot of choking episodes when they eat or they might be avoiding certain foods um, because of the risk of choking and um, they end up eating a little bit less than they otherwise could be eating. Um, another thing that we look at is weight. So if patients are unable to gain or maintain a healthy weight, we might think about a feeding tube as a tool to help with that problem. And weight loss is a really common symptom in ALS, and it's something that's multifactorial. So some patients lose weight because, understandably, they're having more trouble chewing or swallowing their food. Um, we also know that with muscle atrophy, people can lose weight. Um, as people are... Um, potentially not moving around as much or exercising, they can have some weight loss. Appetite loss is another big symptom in ALS that we see. Um, it could also be due to what we call a hypermetabolic state that we've noticed um, through some of our research that ALS patients typically burn about 30% more calories than the average person. So if you combine all these factors, trouble chewing and swallowing, hypermetabolism, it can be really difficult to maintain weight. And so we think about a feeding tube as something to help slow weight loss in the disease. Um, some of our research has shown that there's a correlation between a higher body mass index, which is your um, weight relative to your height, and uh, slow disease progression. So we think of weight as a really important thing to look at and try to um, slow weight loss as much as we can. As long as it's safe, um, you can eat food and drink by mouth with a G-tube in place. So that's a big question I get from a lot of patients are, if I get a feeding tube, does that mean I have to stop eating? And the answer is no. You can use it in addition to eating the foods that you normally would. Um, another thing that guides us in thinking about a feeding tube is if a patient has had any big changes in their breathing. Um, maybe they're having a lot more trouble breathing if they're laying flat or they're noticing some shortness of breath with certain activities or they're relying on breathing devices a lot more, we want to be really careful about having them undergo a procedure or do something that could cause a lot of stress on the body if they're already working a lot harder to breathe. Another important point to consider is that you can have a G2 placed prophylactically or um, have it placed before you really start to need to use it. All that we ask is that a person would flush it once a day with water just to keep it maintained and cleaned. So using your G-tube, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the three main ways that you can use your feeding tube are number one for hydration. Um, dehydration is a really common problem in ALS. It can cause people to become constipated, um, feel pretty fatigued. Um, it can cause secretions to become really thick and difficult to manage. Hydration is very important. So you can use the tube as just an easy way to get in all of your water needs for that day. Um, also for nutrition through the different formulas um, or homemade formulas that um, Danica is going to talk about a little bit later. You can also utilize the 
to, to get in your daily medications, either through crushing or liquid. So some factors that affect how a patient might use a G-tube that we like to kind of touch on when we're talking about it, um, just for people to understand and start to think about while they're planning ahead. Um, number one is insurance coverage. Um, so each patient's insurance coverage may vary. Um, some of the formulas um, that are provided through like a vendor for feeding tubes are covered or sometimes there's an out-of-pocket cost. If that's something that's a barrier to somebody getting a feeding tube, we want to know about it. Um, we can help you get that, um, get that information and then navigate that problem. There's ways that we can get um, financial assistance or help for formula in the home. Um, caregiver resources is another factor to think about that impacts how somebody might use their tube. Um, maybe somebody has a family member who's going to be helping them actually do the feedings if they have some hand weakness. Um, and so we start to think about a schedule way to do the feedings maybe before their family member goes to work and then when they get home from work at the end of the day. Um, also personal preference. Um, the G-tube is a tool and you can use it as much or as little as you want depending on where you are in your disease and, and what your goals are. So what are the common types of G-tubes? So um, these are just some three pictures of some common tubes that we use at Mass General Hospital. Um, there are differing brands or types of feeding tubes depending on your institution or the hospital or clinic that you go to. Um, one of the really common ones at Mass General is called the Cook Tube, which is the one on the left. Um, that's the one with the red cap, um, and we'll have a, another picture of it in the next slide. Um, the second one is called the Mickey Button, um, or it's also known as a low-profile G-tube. Um, the, the cook tube sticks out of the abdomen. The Mickey Button actually lies flush against the abdomen, um, and it's a little bit smaller. Um, the MIC G-tube is another one that they're starting to incorporate um, at Mass General for more patients. Um, it's sort of a combination of the look of a Mickey button, but the structure of a cook tube, as you can see, this one also sticks out a little bit. Um, but they have different ways to secure, such as a balloon or a um, pigtail, which you can see the twist is called a pigtail in the cook tube. Um, and these are tubes that we can show patients at clinic and have you guys like hold them and, and open and close the, the fasteners and um, help you determine which one's right for you. Um, the final say in what tube's gonna be right for you would be based on the surgeon, um, somebody's anatomy might require they have one tube over another, um, their past surgical history might impact that. Um, but really what we just wanted to get across is that there's many different types um, and one tube isn't necessarily better or safer than the other. These are just the options that you might be presented with. So what are the main differences about um, the tubes? So we think of the Cook and the Mick tube as the longer tubes that hang out. Um, generally, these are tubes that don't have to routinely be replaced. You can see that red cap is sort of a tab that you can flip open and you could connect a syringe and that person in the picture underneath the Cook tube is administering formula through a syringe that they just push in. Um, the Mickey button, by contrast, lays flat up against the abdomen, and it has an attachment called an extension tubing that connects to the button. And usually we like to um, have patients replace their Mickey button just for routine maintenance every six months. They can get a little bit more um, wear and tear on them compared to the cook, so it's good to come in um, and have it replaced. And the replacement appointment, um, just to let you know, is a quick in and out of the um, G-tube clinic in about an hour. Um, and Taylor's gonna go into what the initial procedure is like, which requires more of a long overnight stay at Mass General. So as you can um, sort of probably have been able to tell by now, there's different types of feeding tubes. And similarly, there are many different ways to insert a feeding tube when we're thinking about procedurally how it's done. Um, we can talk in a lot of detail at our clinic visits with our patients about the way that they do the procedure. Um, generally at Mass General, we go through interventional radiology to place feeding tubes in our patients, um, which means that they use imaging to visualize where the stomach is and then make an incision and put the tube in from the outside into the stomach. Um, there's also other ways to do it. Um, some people might have heard of a PEG tube, P-E-G, which stands for um, percutaneous endoscopic G-tube, which means they use an endoscope or a scope that goes into the um, mouth and sort of placing a tube from the inside out. 
Um, there's also a couple of different surgical methods to place a feeding tube. Um, and what method or what way we do a procedure can depend on the hospital. It can depend on the patient and their past surgical history. So we encourage you to talk to your doctor or your ALS team to determine what procedure is right for you. And um, we may reach out to the um, procedure teams in preparation of someone's procedure to get their input on that. Um, we have done some research on the different methods of placing a feeding tube in ALS patients. And um, as of right now, there um, isn't really straightforward data that says that one procedure is better or safer than the other. Um, I, I think overall you just want to look to the standard practice of your institution and make sure that place knows your, um, your disease. And at Mass General, our IR team knows ALS uh, really well, and they see a lot of our patients, so you kind of get a specialized care for that reason. Um, if one of our patients is going to use an outside hospital to have a G2 place, that's absolutely fine. Um, we encourage them to do what's easiest for them, um, but we're happy to reach out to those teams at outside hospitals and give them any ALS education that they need to make sure that our patients have a really good experience. So now I'm going to hand it over to, to Taylor Starrett. Um, she's one of our other nurses who's going to be giving you guys some information on the actual procedure day and what's involved in having a G2 if you decide to get it done, um, particularly at Mass General Hospital. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, um, there are each institution has their own kind of um, procedure for scheduling procedures and what the procedure will be like. But I'm going to talk about today what our process is here at Mass General. Um, so if you do decide to get a G-tube, the first step would be to schedule a pre-op appointment. Um, this could also be called a history and physical or an HNP. During this visit, um, you'll meet with your provider, so either your nurse practitioner or your doctor. You'll also meet with your nurse and a speech therapist at that visit. The provider will actually perform the physical exam. Um, your nurse will meet with you to review any medications that you're taking, any allergies that you have, um, your past surgical history, especially any abdominal surgeries that you've had in the past. They'll do teaching and answer any questions that you have. And we'll also get a healthcare proxy on file at that time. Um, this is a hospital policy that we do for anyone undergoing surgery. Um, this is not unique to an ALS patient at all. Um, and if you already have a healthcare proxy, we'll just go over that again. Um, and if you don't, we can do it during that visit. Um, a healthcare proxy, for anyone who doesn't know, is a legal form naming someone you trust to make medical decisions on your behalf if you're not able to make the decisions yourself. Um, during that visit, you'll also meet with speech therapy, as I said. Um, they'll do a baseline swallow evaluation um, just so that we can share that with the inpatient team when you're admitted so that we're all on the same page to keep you safe with your swallowing abilities. Um, after that visit, you'll have some labs and EKG done. And if you have had any past abdominal surgery, we may ask you to have an abdominal CT scan done. Um, this helps to show if any movement happened during the surgery um, or if there's any scar tissue or anything like that. And then your procedure will be scheduled within 30 days of that pre-op visit. So what should you bring with you to MGH on the day of your procedure? Um, so we strongly recommend that you bring any non-invasive ventilation that you use or your BiPAP machine. Um, so some patients don't use a BiPAP machine at all. Some patients use it at night. Some patients use it during the day as well. Um, but no matter what, if you do use a BiPAP or a NIV machine, um, we ask that you bring that with you on the day of the procedure. Um, suction is available at the hospital, so you don't need to bring that with you. If you use a cough assist, you can bring that if you want. Um, you should also bring any communication devices that you use, and you can bring medications as well. A note about the communication devices, um, you won't be able to bring your own personal communication device into the operating room with you. But we'll work with you during your pre-op visit to come up with a communication plan so that you will be able to communicate in the operating room should you need to before the procedure. Um, if you bring medications with you, we just ask that you please keep them in the bottles that you got them in 
so that the floor will know what type of medications they are. And then also, if you are on Radicava, you will not be able to get your Radicava treatments while you're at your overnight stay in the hospital. What can you expect on the day of your procedure? Um, so on the day, you'll report to interventional radiology. Um, that's located in our main hospital building on Ellison 2, but we will give you specific instructions on that day. We ask you to arrive two hours before the scheduled procedure. You'll come in, check in at the front desk, they'll give you a hospital gown to change into, and then they'll take you back to the pre-op area. Um, while you're in the pre-op area, a nurse will take your vital signs, insert an IV, and you'll meet with your surgeon and anesthesiologist before the procedure. The anesthesiologist will perform their own assessment and exam. They'll go over any medications that you're taking, and at that time, they'll determine what type of anesthesia would be best for you. So there are a couple different types of anesthesia um, that they might use for this procedure, and they range from mild or conscious sedation to full sedation or general anesthesia. And we leave that decision up to the anesthesiologist who examines you on that day. The whole procedure from start to finish takes about an hour, but the actual insertion of the G-tube takes only 20 to 30 minutes. Um, after the procedure, they'll take you to the PACU, which is the post-anesthesia care unit, where you'll recover and come out of any, any anesthesia that you are given. They'll monitor you for any pain um, and watch you uh, right after the procedure. Then you'll be admitted to an inpatient floor for an overnight stay. Um, this could either be a neurology floor or some other floor, depending on your needs. When you're ready to go home, um, there are a couple of things that we do at Mass General before you're discharged from the hospital. So we have patients stay overnight for a few reasons, one of which is to have time to meet with a nutritionist. Uh, the nutritionist will offer any recommendations on what kind of calorie intake is right for you, how much formula you should take in per day, and what type of formula would be right for you. You'll also do um, some teach, your nurse will do some teaching with you, and they'll show you how, and your family or your caregiver how to actually do the tube feeding at that time. They'll also have you show them, um, they'll have you demonstrate the feeding as well, so you can ask any questions you have at that time about actually administering the feed. You'll also meet with our tube feed vendor at Mass General who will help get you set up with formula delivery to your home and they're able to set you up so that you have formula waiting for you when you get home from the hospital. Um, you'll also see your IR provider one more time. to They'll evaluate the site and be sure that you're safe to go home. What to expect after your procedure. Since it is a surgery, you can expect some discomfort around the site. Uh, patients have described this as kind of a muscle soreness or sort of a pulled muscle feeling. If you are experiencing any discomfort, please call your provider or your nurse um, and they'll help make some recommendations about pain medications that might be right for you. Um, you can also expect a small amount of drainage or crusting from the site. This is normal, but however, uh, you should call your doctor or nurse if you notice that drainage along with a fever, redness, any heat around the site, foul smelling drainage, or increased pain or tenderness at the site. And that being said, if you have any questions at all about pain you're feeling or anything you're unsure about, um, call your nurse or doctor and we can help work through that with you. You'll also notice on this picture that we have on the screen, um, you'll have some what we call T-tacks around the site and we'll go into that in more detail on the next slide. So T-tacks are sutures or stitches that IR puts in um, before the procedure to help pull your stomach towards the abdominal wall. And you can see in the top picture on this screen, uh, the T-tacks just pull the stomach closer so that they can insert the tube from the outside in. And this is kind of what we were talking about, one of the ways that the procedure is done. Um, also, after the procedure, um, the T-tacks are removed 10 to 14 days after the placement. Um, this can be done in our ALS clinic 
or it can be done locally if that's more convenient for you. Um, if the TTACs fall out, there's no need to panic. That can be normal. And one other thing I want to mention is while the TTACs are in, um, we ask that you please keep the site dry. We don't want you to get it wet um, while those stitches are in. And this is because keeping the area dry can help to prevent any type of infection. Um, so during the first 48 hours, we recommend a sponge bath only, uh, no showers or baths at that time. But after the first 48 hours, you can shower as long as you cover the site. Um, so it doesn't get wet. If you feel like you do need to clean around the site, you can just wet a Q-tip and just clean lightly around the site. Um, but don't apply any lotions, perfumes, or ointments um, to the G-tube site at all. And now I'm going to hand things over to Danica to talk to you about um, some home care of your G-tube. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about care at home, and this is after the TTACs are out um, and you're back to normal activity, usually a few weeks after the procedure. Um, so general care and cleaning around the G-tube, we um, usually recommend just mild soap and warm water, um, nothing like alcohol or hydrogen, excuse me, hydrogen peroxide because that can be a little bit more irritating to the skin. Um, olive oil is sometimes a, a tip or trick to use if you're having the, that crusty, um, dried skin around um, the G-tube. You can just apply a little bit of olive oil with a Q-tip to get rid of that. So activity with the G-tube. Um, after healing, and again, a few weeks after, um, you can return to all normal activity. This can include showering and getting your G-tube wet, um, even in water if you enjoy swimming. Pools and oceans are completely fine. We just don't recommend ponds and lakes because of the bacteria in there. It's also very safe to travel. There's no restrictions. Um, if you want to bring supplies and formula onto your carry-on, we can always provide, um, or your ALS team can provide a letter of medical necessity um, to the TSA department just to um, get that onto your carry-on if you need that. Um, transfers can sometimes be a little bit more difficult um, because of where your G-tube's placed. It depends on if you're using a lift or if the caregiver is helping lift you in that sense. So it's always important to let your caregivers know that you have a G-tube. Um, and also there's ways in, um, to kind of tuck that G-tube closer to your body. You can use an abdominal wrap, you can tuck it into your clothing, or use some gauze tape um, to keep it more secure. So troubleshooting the G-tube. Um, there's a few issues that can come up um, after getting a G-tube, and we just want to review some of our recommendations and ideas. Um, we ordered these from uh, most common to least common, but these may or may not pertain to you. So just some, some things we're going to review, and um, you can always have this chart for after if you wanted to reference back. Um, but the first one's difficulty tolerating feeds, and this one is probably the most common, and it depends on how often you're using your G-tube um, and how your body is processing the formula. You can experience some difficulty tolerating feeds. Um, it sometimes can take your body a little bit of time to adjust. This is something new coming in. We always recommend, you know, starting slow with the feeds and building up um, to, to, to monitor how you're tolerating it. Um, but you should definitely let your provider or nurse know if you're experiencing nausea, fullness, diarrhea, or general discomfort, because um, there's different strategies we can try to, to work around, like adjusting the rate of the um, feeds, adjusting the schedule, sometimes even adjusting the formula. So definitely contact um, your provider and your doctor's office just to review that. Change in bowels is another one, kind of referencing back to difficulty tolerating feeds. Um, because this is formulas are mostly very liquidy, there's a lot more liquid coming into your body, and you can expect, as we say, a little bit more liquid coming out. So your change in bowels is common and in something that's can be expected, but we definitely want you to let your provider know if there's anything that you're um, unsure about or if you're noticing a difference that, you know, it's maybe something that doesn't seem right to you, um, you can contact your provider and we can discuss further. And infection um, is something that comes up and I think a lot of people worry about. Um, it, we have seen it and, it and it can be common, but it's something that um, we can be, can be treated with antibiotics. So things to look out for, um, redness and tenderness. This can be common in, when you first get a G-tube right off the bat because um, it's still healing. 
but if um, you're noticing that the pain, redness, tenderness is getting worse or you're getting a fever and there's different discharge from the site, um, that can be some red flags that there might be an infection going on. So it's important to contact your nurse or provider um, to review this. And also, we always welcome pictures, too, because it helps us get a better idea of what's going on, and we can always um, share that with the team. Okay, so on to the next, so tube clogs. Um, this is depending, again, on how often you're using your G-tube and the type of formula you're using because there's different consistencies. Um, but um, we always recommend with the, with the feeds and if you're doing medications to always flush with water regularly to try to prevent these clogs from happening, but it can happen. Um, so some tips and tricks we, we say is you can use a little bit of Coca-Cola in the tube and that acidity can help break up um, what's in there. You can put it in for a little bit, let it sit, and then flush. Um, you can also just try to adjust and work on the texture of your feed um, by diluting it with a little bit of water or even warming it up a bit um, to help thin it out. Um, and if these don't work or if you're still having trouble, definitely contact your nurse or provider to um, talk about with what to do next. Um, weight loss. So one of the goals of the G-Tube is to provide extra nutrition, extra calories to prevent weight loss. So our goal is to maintain or gain for your weight. Sometimes gaining is difficult, so maintaining is, is one of the bigger goals. But if you're finding that you're still losing weight even with this extra nutrition and extra feeds through the G-tube, definitely let your nurse or provider know because it might mean that we need a new type of formula or maybe a different amount. Um, so definitely let them know. If the tube falls out or gets pulled out, so this is less common, but it does happen. Um, sometimes if, you know, in a mid-transfer, you can have a little tug and you're your tube can come out or some other accidental um, thing can happen. So the most important thing is to immediately put that tube back in just to hold the place. The skin around is always healing and continue to heal, so we want to make sure you keep that tube in just to hold the place and prevent that skin from, from closing up. Um, but we don't want you to do any feeds or meds or, or any flushes through it until you get it checked out and make sure that it's in the right um, Spot and that they can maybe have to put the G2 back in fully. So we want you to go to the emergency department to, to have that checked and then call your nurse or provider just to let them know about what's going on. The last one we're going to talk about is hypergranulation tissue, and I, we have a slide next that's going to show a picture of this. Um, this is something also called proud flesh that um, it can be common in that you'll see when the, when the site is healing and um, it's this overgrowth of tissue around the G-tube. It looks like that in that top picture, pink and beefy red. Um, and it's very vascular in that area, so it can be painful a little bit and it bleeds easily even if you're like cleaning around it a bit. Um, so what to do if you see this? It, it can happen and if it's not bothersome and if it's not uncomfortable, it's okay to just monitor it and, um, and you know, see it as time passes. But if it is bothersome, painful, uncomfortable, you can definitely let us know there's a treatment, silver nitrate. Um, we kind of look at it as like a wart removal, like that picture um, below. Our goal is to try to get rid of it. So you can apply a little silver nitrate, which they can do through, through us. It's through interventional radiology usually, and to help get rid of that tissue. So the different types of formulas. All formulas are lactose-free, high-calorie, nutrient-dense. The fiber content can differ in each type of formula and um, whether it's all natural or organic um, ingredients. We definitely defer to the nutritionists and, and insurance as well can play a part in what type of formula is right for you. So that's something we can discuss more when that time comes. And the last thing I'm just going to go over is the different types of feeding methods. Um, so the first one is um, the bolus syringe, and that is like that syringe on that top. You're, you would put the feed in as, as you attach it to the G-tube, and then you can use that plunger to give yourself the feed. We just recommend going slower um, to not cause any kind of stomach upset. Um, it could take about five minutes. The most common one we see is the gravity syringe, and that's like that picture below with the person with the pink purple shirt. Um, you put, you attach the syringe to the G-tube and then without the plunger in, and then you pour in the feed and you've got to let it flow in by gravity. Um, that can take about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the third one is gravity bag, which is that bag right next to it, and it's kind of a similar method. It can pour in maybe a little bit more formula, and it has that roller clamp on it so you can adjust the rate. So you can even make it up to 20, 40 minutes to give yourself the feed. And then the last one is the overnight pump, which is that picture all the way to the right, 
And that one kind of looks like an IV pool in a way that you can calculate or put in how many um, milliliters of your feed you would get an hour. And that can be over a longer period of time or overnight. So we always say talk to your nutritionist a nurse and provider about the different methods. Um, and this, again, also can depend on insurance coverage and um, what is best for you. So um, definitely something we can discuss more. But as you can see, there's a lot of things that can come up. So if you have any questions or concerns, you can always call these nurses or you can call your nurses. Oh, our picture isn't up. <laughs> We have we had a picture of us, <laughs> but now it's not there. <laughs> so but. just to add to the mystery, our picture is missing. Um, we'll be posting a picture. Maybe we can send it out as an email later on so you guys can see our faces. Um, we try to update our pictures on our website as well. Um, so just don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, please know we will be revealing ourselves soon. Yeah. <laughs> and we want the biggest takeaway from this is that you can always ask questions um, and you're never alone in this process. So, and we know this is a lot of information you can always reference back to, back to, but it's always okay to ask. So leading into that, we are gonna open up this now to any questions you guys have. So bear with us because we're gonna try to figure out the best way so that we can see them because we can enter them into the chat if you would like. Um, and I think we're sharing the screen, so. Oh, oh hi, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll look at some of the ones that have come in. So while we're sitting here, are there any common questions that any of you nurses um, get on a regular basis, would you say? Is there a common question that you can think of? Mm. Yeah, Sarah, are you, if you want yeah. to take that. You've been here the longest. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're the youngest. So um, I'd say one of, one of the most common questions we get that I, um, I'm just looking at as they're coming in. So one of the most common ones that I get um, is can I still eat if I get a feeding tube? Which I know we talked about earlier, but I, just, I saw some people were logging in a little bit late. Um, so just because you get a feeding tube doesn't mean you have to stop eating by mouth. The majority of our patients actually um, continue to eat by mouth while they use the G-tube to supplement their nutrition. Um, so just know that it's not um, one or the other. Um, you, can, you can definitely utilize the G-tube as much as you want and continue to eat for pleasure. And on that, good segue, Sarah, seeing if you want um, to read so, the question that just came in. Yep, yeah, so the, one of the questions is, on average, um, how much time does it take for a caregiver to maintain a G-tube each day? Um, that's a really good I question. It depends, so it depends, yeah. yep, it depends on how much the patient is using the feeding tube. I would say um, in terms of cleaning and maintenance, it's something that can be incorporated into your regular ADL, so if like, somebody's washing up in the morning and they're in the shower, um, you just you just soap and water the G-tube site once those sutures come out. Um, so there shouldn't really be any added time for care and maintenance. Generally, um, the feedings, I sort of equate to like a regular meal time. So if somebody's doing three feedings a day, it should take around the same time it would take for breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, keeping in mind though that generally meal time for an ALS patient, especially if they are having swallow problems, can be extended. It can be longer than average. Um, so it would actually, if you're somebody who it takes you a long time to eat enough calories by mouth, this will probably actually shorten your meal time. Um, the most common way that people do feedings is by the gravity syringe, and the formula comes in these cans or milk cartons, depending on the type. So generally our recommendation, especially when people start the feedings um, to supplement what they're eating, um, generally people are recommended to do around two to three feedings per day, one to two cans per feed. So if you think about, um, you know, it would take like an average of maybe 10 to 15 minutes for a can, a full can of formula to go in. Um, say you do one to one and a half per feeding, um, maybe we're looking at, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, the setup and breakdown is pretty quick. You have to um, get the formula out, attach the syringe, pour it in and let it flow in by gravity, and then flush before and after each feeding with a little bit of water, about half a syringe full of water. Um, so all in all, it should be about a 30-minute ordeal, and you can reuse the syringes, wash it out with some water. Mm -hmm. 
That's um, a good question another, coming in. Yeah, what does the formula smell like, and also what temperature is best uh, during a seat? Mm -hmm. I think I think the temperature one can definitely depend on on your tolerance too. But we say room temperature is is usually the best too. Sometimes if it's a little bit colder, it can be a little bit more irritating. I think to the to the stomach. Um, as far as the smell, um, I think it also can depend on the type of formula too. There's different ingredients and in different brands, um, so that one can be. Um, I would say different. it smells similar to like a protein shake. Um, if, if you guys are familiar with making a protein shake, we've we've had some vendors come in and give us samples of formula, and mm -hmm. that's generally what it smells like to me. Yeah. Um, or if you've ever tried um, Ensure or Boost, it smells kind of similar to that too. Any other questions? I think we have a list that we're looking at. Um, how, the next one is, how long is a G-tube good for? Two months, a year, um, for each G-tube shown in the example. So let's see if we can go, just go back to the pictures that we had. All right, so if we're looking at the types of G-tubes at Mass General, the cook tube that um, goes in, typically a, a cook tube or a mixed G-tube, based on our experience, um, as long as there's no problem with the tube, it can go in and stay in indefinitely. It doesn't need to be switched out. Um, there isn't generally enough wear and tear that it breaks down or something happens, but of course, you know, anything can happen. Um, so if it does need to get switched out, um, it's actually a pretty quick visit. Um, it's an outpatient clinical visit to interventional radiology. It generally, if they're going to switch a G-tube out because there's a problem with it, they'll give a little bit of numbing um, lidocaine at the site, um, and then they'll pull the old tube old G tube out and just insert a new one in there. Um, you can do that within a matter of minutes. The Mickey button, um, based on the material and the type of tube, the oops, the manufacturer recommends that um, an uh, interventional radiology's recommendation generally is that the um, this type of G tube be replaced about every six months, depending on the person, depending on how often they use it. So usually, um, if somebody's coming into clinic about every three months, we can try to have an appointment on that day to have the tube switched out quickly. And it's the same procedure, a little numbing, old tube out, pop the new tube in. Next question I'm seeing is, um, we've had the G tube, the MIC tube for three months and still change the dressing around the insertion site. Do we need to do that? That's a really good question. Somebody else want to tackle that one? Um, I, I think that the dressing that you have around the insertion site, it isn't, it isn't needed um, unless you feel like you, you need some sort of like barrier in between your skin or the, the G2, but you can definitely take that off if it's more comfortable um, and just have that G2 there. And you can just do the regular cleaning like we kind of review with just some warm soap and water um, around the site. Um, yeah, sometimes your vendor, usually your vendor will provide you with like some um, gauze that you can place around the G-tube, um, and they can give you a monthly supply of that like indefinitely. And some people like to put a little bit of gauze around, especially if they're the type of person that has maybe a little bit of just regular serous drainage, which is totally normal. Um, they like to have that gauze in place just to keep everything kind of contained. Um, but you certainly don't have to have the gauze on there every day. It really just depends on, on how you want to use it. Um, and just, um, if, do you want to do one more, one or oh. two more question? Yeah. Um, is there a preference on tubes that would better be better suited for people of different ages or weight? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we always say that it depends on. It depends on. It can be an individual. Um, thing, I guess, choice. choice, but it will depend on when you are in the um, procedure with talking to the doctors and um, anesthesia about what tube's right for you. It depends on your anatomy and where your stomach is. Um, 
So like Taylor had said that they sometimes recommend doing a CT scan if you've had abdominal surgery before, that's kind of to visualize where your stomach is. Sometimes they, you know, depending where your stomach is, they might need a longer tube or a shorter one. So um, it definitely can be a, a more personal decision, but it's based on the recommendations of the team there. Mm -hmm. and to add. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just to add, if you do get the cook tube or the mic tube to start out with and you want to switch to the Mickey button, we can talk to interventional radiology and see if that's something that based on, again, where your stomach is, if that would be possible. Um, it Typically, you need to leave the cook tube in for about a month, um, and then we can try to switch that cook tube out for a Mickey button. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that I, I personally didn't sort of think about or realize until um, we started looking into G-tubes is that um, everybody's stomach is actually in a slightly different spot in mm -hmm. their body. So sort of what Taylor's talking about is um, some people's stomachs are up a lot higher or a lot lower, um, and so that can dictate what type of a tube um, we're able to place. We try to go by the person's preference. If they really like the look of the Mickey button, we'll do everything we can to get it in there. Um, but sometimes we're driven by anatomy because everybody's a little bit different. So um, I'm just going to let Judy wrap up. I think that's, those are all the questions. Um, let me see if we've got a couple more coming. I'm just going to leave it maybe one more minute for questions. Um, with insertion, what percentage require any insertion down the throat. Oh, I see. Okay, so the question is um, procedurally when the G-tube is placed, what percentage of patients require um, the procedure to be done endoscopically or where they put a scope down the person's throat, like um, their swallow area and goes directly into their stomach. Um, and then they use that scope to make an incision from the inside of their stomach out. Um, so. That depends on the institution. So at MGH is what we call like an institutional bias. Um, we have a specific ALS protocol set up in interventional radiology. So the large majority, um, at least right now in the last um, 10, five to 10 years or so at, at Mass General, um, the majority of our patients go through interventional radiology for a feeding tube, which is a radiologically placed G-tube. So nothing um, going down the throat to scope. Um, but some patients, um, because of their past surgical history, can't have it done through IR and they might need a different type of a surgery. I would say it's generally at, at MGH well under 50% of patients that have to have it done through like a surgical team. Um, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe if they're in the hospital already, um, it might be a different team that places it inpatient versus outpatient, for example. Um, so, so I would say definitely less than the majority at Mass General do it differently. Other hospitals um, do the procedure endoscopically, and that's their primary method of placement. So if you look at another ALS clinic affiliated with another hospital, the majority of their patients might do it that way. Um, so it just depends on your institution. And like I said, it's not necessarily better or safer than the other. Um, and, oh, and the follow-up question to that was, um, do they use a, a camera? Yeah, so the scope part would be using a camera to go into the stomach and see it. Um, all right, so Judy, we'll let you take it away with the last slide. Okay, okay, so first of all, here's our screen for feedback and comments. And if anyone is listening and still has um, some questions or comments or ideas for future webinars, brought to you by your MGH ALS nurses, please uh, send an email to alsresearch at partners.org, or you can call me um, at 617-724-8995, and I'll be happy to get back to you. We really, truly appreciate you listening and participating. We hope you learned some valuable, helpful information. We hope it wasn't scary, and we want to remind you that May is ALS Awareness Month, so please hug your favorite ALS patient or caregiver from your MGH ALS nurse team. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.